Hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And today in my podcast, uh, our guest is Arda Mevliu Togliu. Uh, hi, Arda. How are you? Hello. Hello. Uh, very nice uh, meeting you. And thank you very much. How about you? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. Or Although we are having war in Ukraine, we will be talking about it. Uh, just for the you know introductory uh, phase, uh, intro, you know, for, for the sake of introduction, Arda is a is an independent defense analyst uh, uh, based in Turkey. Uh, and we already had pleasure to talk uh, and at least once record our conversation. So for all those interested, you can search out our conversation from the past. Today, we will be talking entirely about the conflict in Ukraine, what it tells us in terms of the art of war, operational planning, operational conduct, what surprises us, what was not surprising. And especially I will be interested what Arda wants to say about this. Uh, so the floor is yours, Arda. You know, you, you can say some, you know, whatever you, you, you wish at the beginning and we will get granular into more details. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, my sincere regards from Ankara uh, to all my Polish friends. Yes, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we are witnessing yet another war, a uh, major one, and this war is happening uh, in the middle of Europe, uh, almost literally in the middle of Europe, and it is we have been witnessing very heartbreaking uh, scenes from uh, there. Uh, it's been uh, almost 13 days, and uh, the casualties, civilian casualties, and the damage to civil infrastructure is mounting, and this is very saddening. Uh, especially for Turkey, uh, for us Turks, because uh, we have very uh, deep uh, historic roots uh, with those people. With those people, I mean uh, Ukrainians and Russians and Poland's. Uh, the land of Ukraine has been uh, known as Rutenia in Turkey, as uh, Poland uh, uh, is known as Lehistan. And we had in Ottoman uh, era, very strong relations as well as wars with those uh, countries. So we, uh, this geography ties us uh, together uh, uh, apart from political, economic, military uh, and industrial uh, re relations. And also Ukraine as well as Russia are leading uh, foreign trade partners. We have very, as I mentioned, very uh, strong historic relations and also uh, the cultural relations are very strong. Uh, so this war already has uh, has very, very se severe uh, effects on uh, Turkey, economically, psychologically. So uh, we sincerely wish this violence is, uh, is stopped instantly and no more casualties are given. But as we will uh, discuss uh, later, uh, unfortunately, uh, a peace, uh, so a peaceful solution, uh, is uh, not there yet. So, uh, on the early hours of 24th of February, Russian uh, armed forces initiated a large-scale operation on Ukraine, and this operation came as a surprise for many observers in Turkey. And I am sure uh, to many in Poland as well. It's surprised because uh, many observers uh, expected a limited scale conflict in the Donbas area, in Donetsk and Luhansk uh, provinces. And uh, many observers did not expect Russia to initiate a large scale operation. I was not among them. I was expecting a large scale offensive by Russia because especially uh, since early last year, uh, Russian armed forces uh, have, have, uh, had been uh, deploying large amount of troops, units uh, in and around, uh, it's, uh, in, in, around the borders with Ukraine and also in Belarus. And the number of these uh, troops, uh, the equipment that they had brought uh, signaled a much more uh, larger campaign uh, not just limited to Donbas region. Uh, according to some accounts, Russian armed forces uh, deployed more than 110 battalion tactical groups, the main maneuver units of Russian army, and that constitutes uh, more than 60% or more, around 70% of the whole 
Russian army. That is a significant number. And that, that was one of the clues that yeah, Russia yeah. was planning something big. Yeah, the, uh, you know, on one hand, it's a significant number, but in terms of the traditional warfare, it's not a great number exactly. of troops. Exactly, that was that was my point. Uh, for a full invasion and control all of all Ukraine, uh, that number was not adequate. But uh, to uh, in, to inflict significant uh, damage to uh, Ukrainian military and infrastructure, uh, that number, at least on paper, seemed sufficient. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the 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 composition of the troops, the equipment that they have brought, such as Iskander tactical ballistic missiles, uh, all sorts of uh, tactical uh, and operational electronic warfare systems, such as Krasuha two, Krasuha four, Lear four, those uh, those are significant electronic warfare equipment. Uh, Russia, uh, at least for me or for some observers. Russia was uh, planning something major, not maybe uh, like the whole the control of whole country, the whole Ukraine, but uh, inflicting serious damage to Ukraine. Therefore, the attack on uh, 24th of February came as a surprise for many. So uh, after 13 days, uh, the performance of Russian army has also been a surprise for many observers, including myself. I've been trying to monitor uh, the Russian military transformation and reform uh, since uh, 2008, uh, right after the war with Georgia. Uh, The reforms initiated by the then Defense Minister Anatoly Serdyukov, uh, the organizational changes, the doctrinal changes, and also developments in defense industry. I've been trying to uh, follow up very closely the developments in Russia, and uh, I can safely say, even if the 20, uh, 12 days, uh, the performance is surprising on many levels. I will mention those later. So uh, right after the war with Georgia, uh, Rus- Russian armed forces had uh, experienced uh, a deployment, a large scale deployment to Syria, starting in fall of 2015. And according to many official accounts, uh, including uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, Shoigu them- themselves, uh, Russian uh, armed forces have uh, tested more than 300 uh, types of different equipment, platforms, and systems in Syria. And also, Russian armed forces uh, followed a, a, a rotational basis of deployment of uh, personnel, such as artillery, uh, army aviation, fighter pilots, combat pilots, and also uh, infantry officers, as well as special forces officers. Uh, they tried to uh, they try to deploy as many uh, personnel as possible to Syria to uh, help them gain operational uh, ex- experience, combat ex- first-hand combat experience. That is also a significant thing. Uh, all in all, uh, the uh, the deployment in Syria between 2015 and 2022 has been a major uh, as experience for Russian armed forces. Uh, it's it's like uh, Russia used Syrian experience as a laboratory for its military transformation. At least this was a narrative that has been widely accepted. But uh, right after uh, the, uh, right after the uh, initiation of uh, operation against Ukraine, we have witnessed several uh, curious things. Uh, first and foremost, Russia uh, has, not, uh, has not achieved air supremacy over Ukraine. By air supremacy, we mean that uh, one side uh, for one side prevents uh, the opponent to use airspace for operations, military operations. Uh, it shoot down, shoots down all enemy aircraft, destroys or makes uh, makes uh, airfields uh, unoperable. Uh, so, so the, 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 co- yes, the country becomes uh, the owner of the skies. Sorry for the sorry, man. Yeah. Yeah, but we all know that. Yeah, but so why it took only them like you know one hour before the grunt movement happened? So what is your explanation? Why that's, did it? That's the that's the second thing. Yes, that's the second curious thing. Right after uh, the strikes began, uh, Russian forces uh, started movements from northern sectors as well as northeast and east sectors, and uh, especially uh, the troops that drove to Kiev, they were very lightly armored and they just. Uh, they just transported uh, as if uh, they were in a peacetime formation. Uh, 
Uh, that might be indicative of a miscalculation by Russian uh, higher echelons that Russia expected a very quick victory and a very quick uh, downfall of uh, Kiev government or Zelensky government. I, I think Russia expected uh, the Ukraine government to uh, topple uh, almost immediately after the initial attacks. Uh, that's a speculation, of course, but the nature of the uh, troops that invaded Ukraine and the composition of them suggests that uh, Russia was planning a very quick and decisive uh, victory. That's the widely accepted uh, explanation of the initial mistakes, such as uh, very lightly uh, and uh, lightly defended and lightly armored uh, troops entering Ukraine, the, uh, the, 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 the endemic logistical failures uh, that we are still witnessing, uh, those are indicative of a lack of uh, long-term, lack of planning of a long-term campaign, uh, almost, uh, or at least that's my way of reading the operations so far. Uh, there, is a, there are very interesting examples to this. Uh, for example, uh, on the very first day, uh, Russian airborne troops made an unsuccessful operation to Gostamel airport to seize the airport and to make it uh, operable uh, for uh, the later coming uh, large aircraft uh, to make it as like a, a stepping stone or a, a logistical hub uh, for uh, the later arriving troops. But that operation failed miserably and uh, the troops uh, failed to uh, seize control of the Gostomal airport and uh, had to retreat from there. Uh, also, we are seeing uh, ill-equipped ill troops making uh, unsuccessful attempts to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to disrupt Ukrainian formations. Those are all indicative of several, uh, a, a chain of miscalculations by Ukraine's side. By the so, Russian um, side, by the Russian side, you mean? Yeah. Uh, the Russian side, sorry, uh, by Russian side. And uh, at, at the end of the first week, uh, I think uh, Russia slowly, uh, Russia showed signs of a slow, a reaction or a slow uh, recovery of these mistakes. We have uh, started seeing more active use of Air Force, uh, more widespread use of uh, artillery and cruise missile strikes. According to some accounts, uh, after 10 days, Russia has expanded uh, more than 600 missiles, uh, cruise missiles and tactical ballistic missiles. That's a significant number, but not comparable to what the uh, United States has used in past campaigns. Again, significant in terms of, uh, significant compared to Russian, uh, Russian inventory or Russian way of the uh, operation. So uh, after 12 days, I think Russia has suffered a lot uh, according to open source verified uh, information more than 900 equipment platforms, main battle tanks and all sorts of equipment uh, has been lost. Uh, the loss of personnel is highly speculative. Ukraine claims more than 12,000, which I think is an inflated number, but uh, some estimates, uh, uh, estimates point to more than 2,000 uh, casualties by Russian side. I think the exact number is somewhere in between, and that's again very significant. And uh, this this uh, shows that uh, this shows two things. First, the existing of a chain uh, of miscalculations, and second, despite all these losses, Russia still manages to do, uh, to get some gains on the ground. By looking at the map, I think uh, we can see the main uh, point here. Before the war, uh, I, I mentioned I was expecting, expecting a large-scale operation, but my expectation was the Dnieper River uh, being the main line, uh, and the war would have uh, two fronts, like East Front and uh, West Front. I think I was wrong, and it seems that the operation now has uh, Northern Front and Southern Front. The northern Adha, front, if I, if, if yeah. I may interrupt you, sure. uh, well, uh, at this stage, what would you say about the uh, Ukrainian posture, U Ukrainian mm -hmm. preparations and the posture and anticipation? Yeah. 
uh, very good that you pointed that. Uh, I will uh, uh, come to the front side later. First of all, uh, we should make uh, some uh, points clear. Uh, Ukrainian military, as well as defense, security, and intelligence bureaucracy suffered a lot in 2014. A lot of very important personnel, very important decision makers uh, just switched sides and uh, went to Russia. And Ukrainian military uh, also uh, suffered significant losses in the, uh, in the, in the conflict in Donbas uh, region. Uh, and in the, the time in the time between since 2014, Ukrainian we have observed Ukraine uh, making investment to different areas, such as uh, getting uh, armed drones from Turkey, also making preparations for uh, you know building them in country, uh, making significant investments to anti-tank guided missiles, anti-tank weapons, extensive training and reorganization of artillery troops and also significant investment to artillery forward observers, intelligence, uh, surveillance, and reconnaissance equipment and infrastructure. Uh, and also Ukraine uh, made uh, different important changes and reformation on the establishment and preparation of the territorial, uh, territorial forces, uh, the, the reservist forces, their equipment, their, uh, their weapons, all sorts of training. Uh, so Ukraine prepared itself for the upcoming war with Russia. And I think in some ways that training and preparations pay, uh, paid off. After uh, getting over the initial shock and trauma of uh, the, uh, the, Russian, uh, the Russian attack, I think Ukraine has uh, showed remarkable success in uh, making a defense. Uh, they they, uh, they uh, deployed uh, special forces units, uh, like uh, small dismounted units in the open terrain, uh, forming uh, forming ambush ambush groups, equipped with anti-tank guided missiles such as javelins, such as anlows, and all, all sorts of other RPG type uh, anti-tank uh, weapons. So, so and what was those... they, Abda, So what was their plan? Just to let them let the the Russians in. Exactly. Extend the uh, co communication line of operation because of this, you know, logistics vulnerability. Then exactly. crash and at the same time, exp you know, hit the exposed uh, lines of communication when they are, you know, on the low fuel and stuff, right? Uh, it seems so because in the first one or two days, we saw Russian uh, armored troops, uh, Russian main battle tanks and large armored uh, columns penetrate uh, into Ukraine fast. But uh, shortly afterwards, uh, we saw uh, all types of footage of destroyed uh, fuel trucks, destroyed logistics supply lines, ambushed, and in some cases, uh, many, many uh, vehicles just abandoned by their crew. Uh, very remarkable scenes of ambushes. Uh, I think, yes, uh, Ukraine just permitted Russian uh, troops to advance uh, some portion and then uh, just hit all the logistic lines and communication lines. And uh, so far, uh, that, uh, that tactic just inflicted significant uh, damage uh, to Russian troops. Furthermore, uh, we see two, uh, two very important uh, advantages for Ukraine, I guess, or just uh, two major uh, gains, maybe. Uh, first of all is the information front. Uh, Ukraine, so far, uh, is significantly more successful than Russia in executing an information war on social media, on you know diplomatic levels. Uh, we have been seeing all the footage and image of destroyed Russian uh, vehicles, but we see very little of Ukrainian losses, or we have a lot of different different claims about Ukraine making gains and Ukrainian troops uh, hitting uh, Russian uh, Russian vehicles, equipment, and troops. But uh, Russia, surprisingly, uh, has not been so uh, successful in terms of waging a propaganda war and information war. This is very interesting also. Uh, Ukraine uh, seems to be more successful in waging an information war. Secondly, uh, by watching the, 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 the uh, testimonies of uh, Russian prisoners of war, we see that many Russian soldiers, many Russian troops, even in low-level uh, commanders, 
they seem to be unprepared uh, mentally and also they seem not uh, well informed. On the other side, uh, there is a vast, uh, you know, uh, vast consensus on the Ukrainian uh, public and Ukrainian general, you know, Ukrainian nation. Uh, the the uh, many uh, people in Ukraine uh, have, you know, come together around the idea to defend their homeland or to defend their nation against Russian aggressors. But yes, are you surprised <laughs> by, the, by the high morale that, that was demonstrated by the military? Uh, well, uh, surprised, but in a very different way, because uh, Ukraine uh, demographically is not a homogeneous entity. Uh, there are ethnically uh, different uh, groups or religiously different groups. Uh, I can I cannot say I'm surprised. I I, I got a big surprise, but uh, it is very interesting to observe that uh, Ukrainians are now, you know, getting around the idea of building up a nation by defending it against an aggressor, and that aggressor, the Ru- Russia. And Russian people, Russian people, no, uh, Russian people is not aggressive in this case, but Russia has very strong historic ties. You know, these two nations are not so different from one another, you know, ethnically or religiously. Uh, they can be considered, as we, as we say in Turkey, a neighbor nation or a, a, close, a close relative. So, uh, and right after the end of the Cold War, Ukraine had had uh, found it difficult to you know establish an idea of a nation but in this case i think uh, right after the uh, right after the start of the attack uh, many ukrainians showed uh, you know getting around the idea of this uh, idea the, uh, the uh, nationalism or you know defending the, their homelands this is interesting and this shows a sin- significant difference on the psychological level between the two sides. So, yeah. uh, Arda, what would you think about the, um, you know, sort of the, um, it also seems that the Ukrainians demonstrated the tactical excellence, right? Uh, while you, it is true that Russians usually were not good at tactical levels, they were much better usually at operational levels, starting back even to the uh, to the war with the Germans um, in the for, in the forties of the twentieth century. But w- what can we say about it? It seems that tactical victories and tactical excellence that is much easier to teach by you know yes, by, yes, by the yes. Western uh, you know with the Western help instructors. And they, when the information domain is also excellent, you can translate the victories at the tactical level to the great great currency and great power politics and the diplomacy sphere and, and you know information warfare so how would you how would you assess this you know obviously it seems that they are winning but how come did the russians uh, forget about this thing uh i think uh, they have not been russian side have not has not been able to uh, transform uh, mentally uh, to adopt to the requirements of modern battlefields, whereas Ukraine shows signs of uh, capability. A good example is uh, the performance of Ukrainian artillery in this uh, operation so far. Uh, they seem to uh, they seem to uh, perform remarkably uh, through the shortening of sensor to shooter cycle, which is you know. Uh, deploying forward artillery observers, deploying uh, drones uh, to gather real-time intelligence and convey all the target information, target data to artillery units to uh, create an effective fires campaign or fires mission. Whereas uh, Russian troops, despite uh, they are, they have uh, you know some capabilities. Uh, Russian troops, uh, advancing troops, lack real-time intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities, and uh, they seem uh, to have serious, dis- serious deficiencies in uh, tactical level 
uh, intelligence and surveillance, uh, uh, surveillance systems or capabilities. This is not only achievable through, you know, getting uh, modern equipment, platforms or sensors. This is also possible uh, through, you know, changing the hierarch hierarchy or training or, you know, uh, doctrinal mindset. Uh, if you follow a very strict linear hierarchy, uh, all the way from the army headquarters to the tactical level, you know, uh, battalion or platoon level. Uh, if you follow a strict linear hierarchy, you cannot uh, react to the dynamic situations on the ground, uh, which is required in seconds level. Uh, this is only achievable through more freedom of movement, more so, initiative you know, to tactical oh, commanders. And excellence at ODA loop, right? Where you commute. Exactly. Our... That was, yes, yes. Th yeah. That's the point. Uh, Ukraine so far seems to be successful in uh, deploying very small groups with large initiatives, uh, with large free, uh, freedom of, you know, of, uh, decisions yes. or movements. And those groups assess the situation by their uh, you know own uh, means and they just uh, initiate campaigns so mission command and in sectors commanders responsible exactly. for sectors and they don't need to, to you know to to be controlled by the central government or central headquarters so also the communication is immune to you know electronic warfare and stuff right they they know what to do exactly yeah. And in the, on the dispersed battlefield, which is huge, and you know, uh, with sensors and stuff, right? And light infantry often. And what would you say about mechanized warfare? Do we have any already conclusions about the mechanized uh, yeah. warfare in Ukraine? Uh, last year in July, I was in Odessa for a conference, and I was one of the speakers. And in one of the sessions, I listened uh, to the speech of a Ukrainian army major. And he was uh, speaking on his personal experience in the conflict in 2014-15 in Donbas. Uh, he was a mechanized unit uh, commander back then. And he mentioned that until February 2015, they advanced very quickly against uh, separatist mili militias. But after February 2015, Russia started to uh, provide ATGMs, anti-tank guided missiles, to Donbas militias. And those weapons started inflicting significant damage to Ukrainian ar uh, armored, uh, uh, armored units, uh, destroying a large number of tanks, armored personnel carriers, and armored uh, fighting vehicles. And uh, those uh, weapons uh, were one of the key uh, factors uh, that stopped Ukrainian army uh, regain control over a uh, significant portion of Donbas area. And uh, through, throughout his speech, that major uh, repeatedly mentioned the importance of ATGMs and small unit formations. Uh, they refer, uh, Ukrainian military literature refer to this as mosquito tactics. Uh, back then, they were contemplating deploying unmanned ground vehicles as well as uh, unmanned uh, surface vessels on sea uh, or very small uh, patrol boats equipped with guided missiles to form mosquito squadrons to just you know establish small units and to inflict uh, hit and run uh, to execute yeah. hit and run tactics uh, so uh, ukraine first hand experienced the, uh, the, the the threat of atgm and the the, the uh, effect that atgms create uh, against uh, advancing troops in fact, we also have another, uh, another experience uh, of ATGMs in Syria. Uh, ATGMs have become something like the RPGs of 21st century, in which they have been used against not just tanks, not just armored vehicles, but also trucks, but also groups of soldiers or a very lightly fortified uh, <laughs> outposts. So ATGMs are expanded a lot. And uh, right before the outbreak of the Russian assault, we have seen uh, you know, many NATO countries providing uh, thousands, literally thousands of ATGMs and anti-tank weapons to Ukraine. And I, I'm doubtful that those numbers would be adequate because they are expanded a lot. So to summarize, uh, so far we have seen that the, 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 the uh, the duel or the competition between anti-tank weapons 
and the tank armor uh, is still hot and it's slowly uh, getting in favor of anti-tank anti -tank weapons and tanks and all sorts of armored vehicles will find themselves, themselves increasingly uh, difficult to protect uh, uh, their crew or, and also the, the advancing troops. And Ukraine conflict so far uh, provides very important uh, information for analyzing this, this competition. So mosquito tactics, light infantry, and uh, hit and run tactics, and a lot of ATGMs and and uh, the light infantry weapons that sort of either obliterates the convoys with supplies, but also the, the frontal attacks, especially in yeah. urban warfare or in villages, yeah, where you can have ops, you know, terrain that en enables you to to employ uh, yeah, such exactly. such techniques. Yeah, critically important also in, in, in the context of Poland is critically important. The debate is ongoing now between a heavy mechanized and wheeled and tracked or wheeled, you know, between mob operational mobility and tactical mobility, uh, you know, manipulating terrain and ATGMs and so on and so forth, UAV. And what would you say about UAV? Turkey is delivering a lot of UAVs to, 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 to Ukraine and also you've been, you know, the maybe the best guys uh, on operating drones against uh, UAVs against Russia and against, you know, other foes in the Middle East. So what is your assessment of the UAV uh, warfare in, uh, in the skies of Ukraine? Well, uh, right before the start of conflict, uh, I, I was thinking that uh, this conflict between Russia and Ukraine would be a, would be a very important test for the future of armed drones. Because so far in conflicts such as Syria, uh, Libya, and Nagorno-Karabakh, the armed drones uh, were used against either no air defense or very inadequate uh, air defenses. But in case of uh, Russia versus Ukraine, Russia has all sorts of uh, air defense systems, also numerically superior to uh, Ukrainian yeah. inventory, and also Russia uh, has very different types of uh, very capable electronic warfare systems. So on paper, uh, Russia uh, was or is able to uh, deny Ukraine from uh, using uh, its armed drones, Bayraktars. We still don't know how many Bayraktars are operable right now, even if some of them... Uh, uh, were shut down or hit uh, on ground, we don't know. But uh, even if a handful of uh, Bayraktars survived, Ukraine somehow uh, manages to fly them, operate them, and also uh, manages to strike uh, Russian uh, units uh, with Bayraktars. And in at least two different cases, Bayraktars hit uh, book air defense systems, very significant feat. Uh, very significant uh, feat for uh, Bayraktar. So in any case, uh, armed drones uh, will have a major impact on uh, the course and outcome of modern wars. This is, this is for granted, regardless of the nature of the conflict, whether it is between two uh, nation states or an asymmetric warfare or a low intensity conflict, armed drones of all kinds uh, will have a major and primary role in modern conflicts. Uh, if, I may, if I may take this sure. opportunity, because you know, you're based in Turkey, you're at the forefront of this, of this UAV revolution, and you have had experience fighting Russians and other guys in the Middle East and elsewhere in Libya. Uh, you know, we were seeing f f footages of... Uh, 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 Russian columns being destroyed by Bayaktar or other UAVs when their air defense was on, on the move uh, uh, mode. And so it seems that the Russians are not that, uh, you know, proficient in, in uh, air defense while on the offensive march. Uh, is it the reason because this is the offensive march that you simply, that it was not robust enough or it is simply so, and please tell me because you, you are the insider, it's really difficult to detect and fight combat drone. Uh, and there are two camps today uh, in the professional you know, press uh, uh, that, that try to cover this story. One camp is saying it's so difficult to detect 
because it's small, signature is small, you can't see it. It's not so easy. Uh, there is a lot of noise and there are many of them, especially when you move or something. And, we're, and there is another camp saying, no, they're easy detectable. If you are fighting against a prof professional opponent, they will kill you. So what does your experience, Turkish experience, tell you about it and what you see in Ukraine? Uh, my answer would be somewhere in between the two. Uh, in Bayraktar's case, yes, Bayraktar is a small, uh, it has a small radar cross section. It's also visibly not very easy to spot. Uh, it flies uh, slow compared to the targets, uh, like you know, a fighter jet or a helicopter. Uh, and it, it is more difficult to detect a Bayraktar uh, with the radar of a Russian air defense system, which was designed from the outset to detect and engage a fighter jet or a bomber or a helicopter. However, uh Russian air defense modern Russian air defense systems as well as other existing air defense systems uh, they are equipped with different types of sensors like radars electro optical sensors and their combined their coordinated use should be uh, enough uh, to uh, detect a bayraktar or an armed drone of size similar to bayraktar that's where the main uh, they, that's where main difference uh, comes into equation. Turkey has not used Bayraktars uh, in a standalone fashion. Turkey, in all the operations and conflicts, used Bayraktars in close coordination with electronic warfare, electronic intelligence, artillery units, and other assets. So Bayraktar and Anka, these two armed drones, have been the tip of the spear. And that spear was not formed uh, itself only by the armed drones itself. On the other side of the equation, in order to establish a good air defense umbrella against armed drones, you need to have a coordinated use of different types of sensors and uh, sensors and systems, such as different types of radars, uh, scanning different types of spectrum. Which, which requires quite a lot of logistical undertaking. Exactly. Exactly. Especially when you're in the front troops uh, marching against the enemy and ground enemy and you don't have so much time wasting to be wasted on thinking about their sophisticated exactly. multi-layered uh, defense, right? Uh, putting a, a TOR air defense system in front of the convoy with its radar spinning, it's not, it's not enough to de detect and intercept a, an armed drone. It would be adequate to detect and um, maybe a MI-24 Heinz or um, you know, SU-25, okay. But in order to detect a, a low radar cross-section target like drone, you need to have a well-coordinated and networked air defense system that you know, goes together with the column, that goes together with armored uh, formation, uh, like different types of sensors, uh, command and control sens sensors. And evidently, Russia lacks such capability. Yes, Russia uh, is fully able to, you know, protect its uh, strategic assets uh, with S-300, S-350, S-400. Russia has book and tour systems well uh, capable of, you know, intercepting uh, fighter jets or helicopters. But in order to uh, detect and intercept, you know, uh, a new type of threat like armed drones, Bayraktar, Anka or other types, you need to uh, have different types of eyes, you know, scanning the sky simultaneously and in a coordinated fashion. Uh, this is uh, what Western defense contractors have been working on for the past few years, uh, especially after 2020, uh, those efforts have uh, gained pace and we ha have been seeing more and more solutions on uh, in parallel for this. But Russia preferred just upgrading their existing systems such as Panzers, which, uh, you know, uh, which uh, have a very bad, uh, you know, reputation, uh, especially after Syria and Libya and Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, they just preferred upgrading existing systems. But upgrading the existing systems, you know, uh, by, you know, adding more bandwidth or, you know, uh, getting more developed missiles, they, it, it, this is not the solution itself. You need to have a networked system of systems uh, to you know uh, 
to coordinate all the air defense uh, early warning capability. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. And have you have you heard about the tank engagements, tank against tanks and, and big numbers in Chernihov or elsewhere? Uh, so far, not much. Uh, I'm sure such engagements uh, have taken place, but uh, a majority of engagements are like ATGMs versus tanks and, you know, uh, some light infantry uh, from Ukraine. Uh, but I think in the southern sector, um, uh, near uh, near uh, Crimea, north, northeast of Crimea, uh, there is this, I cannot uh, remember the name of the formation, but uh, there is one Ukrainian uh, armored uh, unit, armored division maybe. Uh, I have I have come across to some accounts that they had you know stopped Russian formations, but uh, we haven't seen any footage or you know positive uh, evidence of such engagements so far. Yeah, be- before we we end this conversation, uh, how would you assess the, uh, the the Russian Black Sea Fleet and its operation? Are they you know and of course this contest between the shore and the sea, you know. It's also a debate in Poland about the navy. We have the you know the the, the long coast, but we have a very small uh, sea. Uh, and uh, why did the Russian didn't put the troops uh, by you know by uh, amphibious landing? And we also have heard reports about uh, even artillery fire, artillery shells, uh, you know, uh, yeah. uh, knocking out the, the 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 Russian ships. So what do you think in terms of the revolution military affairs, which we you know, talked about prior to, to recording? Yes. What would you say about it? And basically, what are your principal observations in terms of the revolution that is taking place in the military affairs in the battlefield? Well, uh, I have not been a defender or, an, or a proponent of shore-based anti-ship uh, weapon systems. I have uh, favored... Uh, you know, uh, aircraft launched anti-ship missiles as a more effective way to cover a large a large sea slats in order to prevent uh, enemy navies. But I think this conflict proved me wrong, and I think we are seeing the importance of shore-based anti-ship capability, anti-ship missile and early warning capability. Uh, Ukraine had developed an uh, anti-ship missile, shore-launched uh, land, land-based uh, anti-ship missile called Neptune, but uh, unfortunately for them, it was uh, due to enter service in April this year. Uh, and if only they had uh, some Neptune missiles, uh, they would be more you know, comfortable in at least protecting the Odessa. Uh, so the initial uh, expectations or initial assessments uh, were based that uh, Russia would be making amphibious landings to Mariupol and then Odessa, but right now, uh, Mariupol, I think uh, they will not need such amphibious landing, but uh, Odessa, uh, we might expect, we might see such an operation. And uh, the case uh, that you mentioned, uh, the, the, the claim that Ukrainians hit uh, a, a patrol boat with Grad uh, artillery rockets uh, is a testimony to the importance of uh, shore-based anti-ship missiles in order to protect the sea lines, because if uh, Odessa also is lost, then Ukraine becomes a landlocked country, uh, cut off from the Black Sea, and that's a major s- strategic defeat uh, yeah. for Ukraine. Uh, in order to establish uh, an A2AD zone, especially uh, against uh, enemy ships, enemy uh, logistic ships and uh, warships, uh, you need to have a credible and uh, adequate uh, shore-based defense, and that defense uh, comes from uh, shore-based anti-ship missiles. I think uh, Turkey also started to make investments on this. Uh, the, during the last defense exhibition in Istanbul last year, we saw uh, the mock-up of the Atmaja, the Turkish uh, indigenously developed anti-ship missile, uh, the Atmaja's uh, land-based version, and uh, such systems. Uh, also, there is this uh, NSM, uh, which Romania recently purchased, uh, such systems uh, prove to be extremely important to establish an A2AD, uh, A2AD uh, zone against uh, large, uh, large, you know, amphibious uh, task force or enemy warships. 
And uh, as you very well know, Russia is no short, uh, has no shortage of uh, tank landing ships as well as small uh, patrol boats. And uh, in order to deter them, uh, you need to have a very good uh, shore-based defensive capability. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that is true. So, you know, the, my last question, <clears throat> and it would be, you know, uh, drawing to an end. So what would your recommendations for Poland be? You know, prior to recording, you were saying that, you know, if I may disclose that, you know, Poland is in, in the region, so to speak, just like Turkey, but Turkey is at least having the, uh, the Black Sea as a buffer. Uh, do you think that the thing might spill over uh, to the entire region? Uh, uh, you know, what would you recommend in terms of the Polish procurement modernization reforms of the military? You know, briefly, what would you say if you dare to say anything? Yeah. Uh, for first, my assessment is that uh, the, the the conflict might easily uh, spill over to uh, Transnistria. In Turkey, we call it Transnistria. Uh, to the Moldova, uh, there is this high risk of spillover uh, to there. And yes, there is also a high risk for the Baltic region as well. I was. Uh, uh, I, I, I was guessing or you know, I was thinking about uh, a, a crisis between uh, Belarus and uh, uh, Lithuania uh, uh, over the Suwalki gap. Uh, that is one of the, I think, hot spots. Uh, but uh, I hope uh, such a scenario doesn't uh, uh, come to a real realization. For the procurement uh, question, I think uh, we have seen once again the importance of networked, uh, the importance of networked uh, formations, uh, small sized, small in numbers, but highly effective, highly maneuverable and uh, having high firepower, uh, like special forces uh, with, you know, uh, real time intelligence gathering capabilities, real time command control and com communications capabilities, and also uh, having the capability to direct uh, you know armed drones air force artillery units to concentrate the firepower to required uh, targets uh, the the importance of highly maneuverable networked and sensor oriented uh, uh, formations would prove extremely efficient against even numerically superior adversaries especially against you know large numbers of tanks and armored vehicles uh, such uh, troops supported by armed drones, supported by efficient artillery, guided artillery especially, and also a, a modern uh, air force that is capable to uh, establish air supremacy over uh, large region. Uh, this would be the key. Uh, I'm, follow, I'm trying to follow uh, the Polish modernization efforts uh, closely. Uh, the F-16 has been a major step. Uh, the F-35 would be another major step. Uh, and of course, we uh, we uh, applaud your decision to uh, procure Bayraktars, and uh, such capabilities would be extremely important uh, in in a, in, a, in, a, in such a scenario to to to, to create a network uh, network defense uh, against even numerically superior adversaries. So I think uh, Poland uh, Poland or any other NATO country should invest more and more to network centric uh, network network centric uh, formations yeah thank you arda that was an excellent conversation thank you my uh, pleasure thank you yeah, very much we will have a chance to talk uh, shortly again you know the, the 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 war ukraine is exactly between turkey and poland and so you know i think we have a lot of things to share in terms of the um, exchange of ideas of the the way you know the direction the battlefield evolves so thank you thank you again yeah, our guest today was arda mevliu togliu from turkey and, and you stay with us uh, with strategy and future my name is yatsek bartoshak thank you very much <laughs>